further ado, we'll get started. For those of you who are new to NACI, we are a national membership association dedicated to educational excellence for children and youth who are experiencing homelessness, and we work from early childhood through post-secondary education. We have local homeless youth task forces across the country, we have 17 state higher education and homelessness networks, and we have a very active early childhood committee. We work by providing technical assistance on policy implementation, and we also bring your voices to Congress and state legislatures. We also work very strongly with young people who are experiencing homelessness, engaging their leadership and their support in our efforts. This afternoon, uh, what we want to do is first give you a little bit of overview about the regulatory process, sort of what it means, how regulations are different from the statute, how they are different from guidance, and then we want to look at three specific proposed regulations that the U.S. Department of Education put forth in its proposed regulations on May 31st. We'll look at a proposed regulation for transportation for students in foster care. We'll look at some proposed regulations around achievement and graduation, graduation data, and also we will look at um, the McKinney-Vento state plan and the proposal to consolidate it with the federal consolidated plan with some specific plan requirements. So there, there are other pieces, obviously this is a, I think a 200 page proposed rule. Um, these are the three that we've sort of honed in on, um, both because we have some questions and some concerns and because we also want to hear your experiences and your views. Uh, we have a preliminary analysis, but we have not submitted our final comments yet, and we very much want to encourage you to make your own voice heard in this uh, public comment process. So a little bit of background, I think everyone knows by now that the statute itself, the law was passed by Congress and signed by the President on December 10th of last year, that it amends McKinney-Vento, Title I, and other parts of ESEA. A little bit of background on effective dates, we know that the McKinney-Vento amendments made by ESSA will take effect on October 1st of 2016, uh, with the exception of the uh, category of eligibility under awaiting foster care placement, which is removed on December 10th. That is because the, the law says one year after enactment, and one year after enactment is December 10th. And most of the Title I and other provisions will go into effect in the 2017-2018 school year. So there's a, a, a staggered implementation of the ESSA amendments that um, pertain to homelessness and to foster care. The U.S. Department of Education has a very important role, um, obviously, in the implementation of this, of this legislation. The department has the authority to issue regulations on parts of uh, ESSA, including Title I. And what the regulations do is they really interpret gray areas of the statute, fill gaps, uh, things that are really necessary for implementation. It's important to know that regulations cannot conflict with the statute. Uh, so that it's not a process by which the, the law can be changed or overruled. It cannot conflict with the statute. Um, the Department of Education is required to publish its proposed regulations in advance and it's required to consider public comments. Once it does that, once the, uh, it has considered pu the public comments, um, then it will promulgate and publish the rules in their final form, and in that instance, those regulations will have the force of law. So they will be binding, in other words. There is also the authority for the Department of Education to issue what's called non-regulatory guidance. Um, this is guidance that is, as its name states, it's non-regulatory, it's non-binding. It's the sort of guidance that we expect from McKinney-Vento. And while guidance does not have the force of law, it does indicate the Department of Education's interpret of, interpretation of the statute. So that's just a little bit of background to understand how um, all of this plays together, the statute, the regulations, and then the guidance. Uh, so as we mentioned, the Department of Education did um, issue proposed regulations, so these are proposed rules, they're not final rules, in the May 31st edition of the Federal Register. Um, you can have a link to that Federal Register site in our preliminary analysis at the link there. Um, if that's long and for some reason your PowerPoint isn't clicking through, if you just go to our website and you go to uh, legislation and policy and legislative updates, you'll see it right there. So you can see our preliminary analysis, which also has a link directly to the Federal Register. The public 
comment period is open and comments are due by August 1st, 2016. So there's a, approximately uh, two months to submit comments. Comments on the regulations are submitted online. You have the link there. Also, there's a link on our website as well for where you would submit com public comments through the regulations.gov portal. So to get into the, the, the substance now, to look at the three proposed regulations that we're zeroing in on, again, I mentioned transportation for students in foster care, achievement graduation data, the mckinney Mental State Plan consolidation, um, and just to, to note that there aren't any other proposed Title I regulations related to the set-aside for students experiencing homelessness. There may be um, guidance on the Title I set-aside, but there are not currently any proposed regulations related to the Title I set-aside for homeless students. So digging into the first one, and I think the one that is of greatest concern to us, the department's proposed regulation uh, states that the state educational agency will ensure that a, an, a local education agency receiving Title I Part A funding will provide children in foster care, I'm sorry, I'm going to, excuse me for half a second, I'm going to minimize my screen so I can, there we go, um, will provide children in foster care transportation as necessary to and from their schools of origin consistent with the procedures developed by the LEA in collaboration with the state or local child welfare agency under the ESSA, part of the, the part of ESSA, um, which is the Title I local plans, even if the school district and the local child welfare agency do not agree on which agency or agencies will pay any additional costs incurred to provide such transportation. So I normally do not make it a point of um, business to verbally read every single word on a PowerPoint slide, but this one is really important. These are, this is the actual language of the, of the proposal. So essentially, it'll be the state's job to ensure that school districts provide the transportation um, consistent with the local procedures, however, um, this would be the case even if the school district and the child welfare agency don't agree on, on how to do it. And you'll see why that is of concern to us in terms of the consistency with the statute in the next slide here. So here's what the law actually says. That's the proposed rule, and here's what the law actually says. What the law says is that local Title I plans must contain an assurance that the school district, the LEA, will collaborate with the state or child welfare agency to, within one year of enactment, again, December 10th, develop and implement procedures for how transportation to maintain foster youth in their schools of origin, when in their best interest, will be provided, arranged, and funded, and it will ensure that Foster youth who need transportation to the school of origin promptly receive it in a cost-effective manner. And also there's a nod here to the fact that it is an eligible use of 4E funds to pay for transportation to the school of origin. But also, if there are additional costs in providing transportation to the school of origin, school districts will provide it if there are, they are reimbursed by the Child Welfare Agency, they agree to pay the costs, or the school district and the child welfare agency agree to share the costs. So the important thing, and you'll see we've got um, at least one of the ifs underlined, if there are additional costs, the school district provides it if, and then lists three very specific circumstances, two of which are essentially voluntary. The LEA, the LEA agrees or the LEA and the child welfare agency agree to share the costs. Um, and the one that is, I guess, involuntary is if they're reimbursed by the child welfare agency. So as you can see, um, there's a discrepancy there between the statute and um, the proposed rule. So based on our members' experiences, based on our own advocacy over the past 10 years, we do have serious concerns about this proposed regulation. Um, as hopefully the, the review of those last slides indicate, the, con the way that in which it actually conflicts with the statutory language of ESSA, but also the way in which it reduces incentives for collaboration. If a child welfare agency knows that all that they need to do is disagree um, and not pay, and the school district has to do it, there is very little incentive to sit down at the table and have the conversation. Um, there's also, frankly, a, a reduced incentive for placing youth in foster care close to their schools of origin and maintaining placement stability. This, too, has been um, noted to us by liaisons and providers across the country that as long as school districts are on the hook or seen as the one who does the transportation, then there's um, a lot less attention placed, 
given to where the child is actually placed and how many times that they move. So there really isn't any fiscal incentive for that placement stability that we know is so important, not just for school, but for all other aspects of a child's life. And we also are concerned, frankly, that this new mandate for transportation for all children in foster care, because now we're talking all children in foster care, actually puts the, the transportation and the protections of students who are homeless, who are homeless at risk. Uh, we know that transportation under McKinney-Vento is extremely challenging logistically, it's challenging fiscally. We know um, and have heard from our members that there is uh, the cost of transportation has served as a disincentive to identify students who are experiencing homelessness and to make good best interest determinations about where they go to school. So that dynamic would be greatly exacerbated by a new transportation requirement and even though there are many, many similarities between children who are homeless and children who are in foster care, the one singular difference is that children in foster care are in the custody of a state agency that has legal responsibility and funding for their, their well-being. So um, it is a, um, it, th those are the things that, that we are concerned about based on, on our knowledge. Patricia, are you joining in now? At the yes, poll? I am. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, we wanted to try to make this webinar interactive and really use it as an opportunity to get input from those of you who are participating today. We know that's difficult to do on a webinar with uh, so many people on it, so we decided to try some polls. So what I'm going to do is launch a poll for you now. We just want to take a, a bit of sampling of those of you who are on the call today to get uh, some information about how things are done in your local community and also your perceptions of some of the proposed rules. Um, so I'm going to launch our first poll now and hopefully you are seeing this now. The, the question is currently right now in your community, whether it's your school district or, or your county, who pays for children in foster care to get to and from their school of origin? Um, and we're gonna ask you to just choose one, and if you're not sure, if you don't know the answer, that's absolutely fine. You can just go ahead and check that one. Um, but this will help give us some baseline information just with those of you on the call. So I'm going to give you a few seconds. I'm watching on my end so I can see how many of you have voted. Um, and we're about two-thirds of, of you have voted at this point. So I will give you a few more seconds to think about that and cast your vote. Okay, it looks like most of you have voted now. So let's give you just two or three more seconds to cast that final vote if you have not done so. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and then I can share this information with you so that you can see what I see on your screen. Um, and we've got a pretty fairly even distribution here among, uh, you know, just child welfare picking up that cost, just the school system side, whether that's at the state or local level, and then a combination of those two agencies. Um, and then many of you didn't have that information and that's perfectly fine. We just wanted to get um, a little bit of a sample from you. So I'm going to hide this poll now. Barbara, should I go right into the next poll now, or is there any yeah. additional information we needed to share? Okay. I don't, I don't, we're still on the, top, the same topic, right? So I think right. go we're forward doing, and poll. We're doing well with the polls so far. I'm thrilled that the technology is actually working. Um, so now we have another poll for you. I'm going to launch it. Um, again, just trying to get your input. We really do want to hear from you so that we are making sure we're providing adequate comments as NACI on behalf of our members. So in your community, do you think that requiring LEAs to provide or fund school of origin transportation for foster youth, would that negatively impact collaboration between your school district or school system um, and your child welfare agency? Um, and again, we're going to ask you to choose just one answer. You might not know, and that's perfectly fair. You can, you can choose maybe, but I don't know, um, or either yes or no in terms of the uh, collaboration. Looks like just about most of you have voted. We'll wait just a few more seconds for you to uh, enter your vote before I close the poll. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. 
and I'll go ahead and share those results with you so you can see them. Hopefully you're seeing this on your screen. 60% um, of you felt like this requirement for school districts to fund that school of origin transportation would affect uh, collaboration between the school district and the child welfare agency. Um, some of you felt that it would really not have an impact, and then of course 22% said maybe, but I don't know. So thank you very much. Um, we have another question to ask you, if you'll bear with us. We really do want to get your input here. Um, so I'm going to launch another poll for you. This is about uh, the placement stability for children and youth who are placed in foster care. So again, if you, if you know or if you have an opinion based on your experience, uh, do you believe that requiring school districts to provide or fund transportation to the school of origin for students in foster care, would that negatively impact placement stability for children in foster care and or the proximity of those placements to the school of origin? And again, we'll ask you to answer just one, uh, just one answer. Um, and if you're not sure, you can just go ahead and indicate that, maybe, but I don't know. Okay, I can see on my end again that most of you have voted, so I will give you just a few more seconds for those who haven't voted yet to uh, indicate your answer. Okay, very good. I'm going to close this poll now. And I'll share the results with you. And we've got about a third, a third, and a third, almost an even uh, split. So a little over a third of you believing that there, there will be a negative impact on proximity and of foster care placements to the school and also placement stability. Um, some of you saying you're not sure, and some of you saying, um, I don't think that um, it will affect placement stability. We do have one additional uh, poll about the effect on homeless students of this uh, potential proposed regulation. So I'd like to share that if we could. Okay, last question. Um, in your experience, based on your experience, particularly those of you who've worked with um, awaiting foster care placement and those of you who are liaisons in local school districts, do you believe requiring LEAs to provide or fund transportation for foster youth could negatively impact the identification of students experiencing homelessness in your school district um, and or the transportation? And here you can actually do multiple answers. So you can say yes to the first two if you'd like. Um, you can say a yes and a maybe. Um, or you can say no anticipated impact. So you can answer mul with multiple answers on this particular question. This poll is a bit more complicated since you can answer more than one answer, so I'll give you just a couple of extra seconds to answer here. I can see that most of you have answered, but I will wait a little bit longer. Okay, at this point, we, it looks like we've got just about everyone responding, so I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And just for your curiosity, we have the results here. We have 40% um, of you seeing that there, the, expecting that there will be pressure on identification, 45% saying that there will be pressure on uh, keeping students in their school of origin. Um, and then we have some maybes and 30% saying no anticipated negative impact. So I want to thank you very much for participating in those polls. We have a couple more coming up later. Um, and also, we do encourage you at any time, to, you can uh, answer comments or questions uh, in the chat box if there are particular issues you think we should be aware of as we prepare NACI's comments to these proposed, proposed rules. Please do feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat box at any time. I will close this poll and let Barbara get back to business. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. So we'll move on to some uh, to the other two. Oops, I'm I am I am sorely challenged with my uh, mouse today. Um, 
we've done the poll, so now we want to look at the proposed regulation for achievement and graduation data. This is for both homeless students and students who are in foster care. So the law itself, the Every Student Succeeds Act, requires state report cards to disaggregate achievement and high school graduation rate da graduation data for McKinney-Vento students and students in foster care. The proposed regulations that um, Ed has put forward use the McKinney-Vento definition of homeless and they use the uh, HHS, the, the regular uh, child welfare definition of in foster care. So they are consistent with federal education law in terms of homelessness and they are consistent with federal child welfare law in terms of the definition put forth of in foster care. One thing that we are interested in here, um, and this is something that the proposed rules actually specifically solicited a comment on, is to try to determine whether the graduation rate calculation for homeless and foster students or other subgroups should be determined at the time the student is enrolled in the cohort or at any time during the cohort period. So in other words, you know, is it when you were homeless, I'll just use homeless for example, is the graduation rate calculated for students who were homeless at, in their last year, their senior year or junior year before they left the cohort, or if they were homeless at any time during uh, the cohort period? So we want to, you know, we, 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 let me back up for half a second. Before we do the poll, let me say that there's different states. There are states that already do disaggregate graduation rates for homeless students and for students in foster care. On the homeless side, what we know is that some of the states, that are, at least one state that disaggregates homelessness for any time a student was homeless in in high school or um, in their in the year before they exited, there's a difference. Uh, the state of Virginia has a uh, graduation rate. is one of the states that have been, has been disaggregating graduation rate for a long time for homeless students, and there is a, a three percentage point difference um, for students who are homeless at any point in time as opposed to in their in their final year. And so not only is there a difference, but the, diff the, the experience of being homeless even once in high school has a negative impact on graduation. So that data really shows that it's not just you know, in your latter years, it's really if you were homeless at any time in high school, you will be less likely to graduate than other students who are living in poverty, other subgroups. So that really caught our eye. And, and now that the department is specifically um, requesting feedback on that, we want to be able to weigh on it specifically too. So Patricia, I'll let you go forward with this poll. Thanks, Barbara. I'm going to launch this one right away without a whole lot of intro. Um, again, we're very interested in your input here. Which students do you think should be included in the cohort of homeless students for, when calculating graduation rates? Um, please choose either youth who are homeless upon their enrollment in the cohort youth who are homeless at any time in the cohort period, both, or I'm not sure. And again, I'm not sure is a perfectly valid answer if that's what uh, you'd like to indicate. I can see that most of you have voted and I see that we have some pretty consistent input here. So I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds to get your vote in and then we'll share the results with you. Okay, it looks like we've got just about everyone voting, so I'm going to close the poll and share the results. And I think it's pretty clear about what Nacy's comments should say about this. We have only 1% of people saying that uh, only youth who are homeless on enrollment in the cohort should be included in that disaggregated data. Uh, almost everyone is saying either at any time in the cohort period or both. Um, so that is very helpful input for us as we prepare our comments. Thank you very much for that. And I will hide this poll. And once again, Barbara, back to you. Okay, so let's see if I can advance the slide without a whole lot of drama here. No, apparently not. I don't know. Sorry about this, guys. My. All right. Um, I will get a battery promptly after this webinar. So the very last proposed rule that we want to talk about this afternoon is the proposed um, consolidation of the McKinney-Vento state plan. And this will be um, of particular interest to those of you working at the state level, but I think it's really of interest to everybody because um, it may affect the sort of specificity 
that the state uh, puts forward in terms of McKinney-Vento. So the Department of Education has proposed consolidating the McKinney-Vento state plan with the state Title I plan, and then the proposal, but it's not a straight consolidation, so it's not just, yes, McKinney-Vento is consolidated. It also, the proposal also includes some of the McKinney-Vento state plan requirements within the consolidated plan. So you can, again, there's a link there to our, um, to our analysis it's that will give you a little bit more detail on that. Um, so what we can say for sure, though, again, is that this would not affect the McKinney-Vento subgrant process or their local Title I Part A process to describe services provided to McKinney-Vento students, including with reserved funds for support, attendance, and success. It does not affect that part of Title I. Um, Actually, I'm going to go back. No, I'll leave it here for a second. So I think it's, it's for those of you who are McKinney-Vento people and know the state plan well, the, what, what the, the part of the specific plan of the requirements that are included in the proposed rule are many of the descriptions um, that are required in the McKinney-Vento state plan. So for example, around preschool, around uh, credit accrual, um, other basic parts of the McKinney-Vento state plan. But what's not in there for example, is the description about how counselors will advise and prepare homeless youth to be ready for college. That's a brand new amendment made by ESSA that's in the McKinney-Vento state plan as the law wrote it, but would not be included in this proposal for consolidation, nor would the assurances around transportation or local liaisons, including the liaison having sufficient capacity, nor a demonstration about reviewing and revising policies that are barriers, including uh, policies caused by absences fees and fines. So there are some things that are omitted there um, that we did have concerns about and we very much welcome feedback on that proposed regulation as well. And this may seem like it's a lot, but hopefully the preliminary analysis that we prepared will make it a little bit clearer and we would again be very welcome of your feedback on this proposal and you could either send it to Patricia or you can um, put it in the, in the chat box. And very lastly, what we want to just really emphasize, even though NACI will prepare and submit formal comments, it and we very much would like to make sure that they're reflective of the majority of the of our members and people who are working with homeless students and students in foster care. We also um, there's no substitute for your own comments. Um, I can, for example, give make general statements, but some very specific examples based on your lived experience. Um, illustrate general points in a way that we really aren't able to at the national level. Um, so we would very much encourage you to submit your own comments and to try to make that helpful. You can see the second bullet there. We produced a template which gives instructions for how you would submit the comments and provides a very basic outline and has some highlighted items in yellow where you can personalize and individualize. And the strong recommendation here would be that you know, if you even to, to rewrite some of our, our template language, to really put in um, your own words and your own experiences. If you think that in your agency you are not the person who is authorized to submit comments, I would very much encourage you to provide this information to, for example, if you have a legislative affairs person or somebody else in your agency who really is charged with that, I would encourage you to make sure that they are aware of these issues so that they can include it in their comments. And of course, you have, um, as a private citizen, you also have the availability to make comments as well. So again, really want to emphasize the importance of commenting, of getting other people to comment, and of individualizing and personalizing your comments to the greatest extent possible. And we'd also, if you are so moved, would invite you to share your comments with your members of Congress, because even though this is now in the department's hands, it is a Department of Education function, members of Congress are also watching very closely. They just passed this law. They are very invested in it being carried out in the way in which they intended it to be carried out, and so they will also be um, interacting with the department in terms of their own views. So it, if it, it um, you could easily uh, just attach your comments, and send them to your members of Congress and say just FYI, wanted you to know my views on this, this is what I submitted, so that they too have a better understanding of the potential impact of these proposed rules on the children and youth that you work with every day. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop and see, Patricia, are there any comments that we should address? 
Hey, Barbara. We've had lots of comments, and again, I really appreciate everyone typing in your comments into the chat box. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have some questions that maybe you can address. So there is one question coming in um, saying that we've already begun collaborating with our state child welfare agency, and this comment is from the state education agency, um, to transition regarding payment for transportation to the school of origin. Now that we've already begun that collaboration and that conversation, do we need to put all of that on hold now until yeah. after we get final regulations? No, absolutely not. And this is one of our big concerns too. Um, is that this proposed regulation would have a chilling effect, would actually stop people. You're, you know, there are, there are, at the local level too, there are conversations are happening. The transportation plan is December 10th, so people are, can read the law and have been um, in advance of the department and trying to practically get things on the ground. So I would urge you to not stop any work that you're doing. I would urge you to stick with the statute because that's what we have right now. Um, I would absolutely um, not want to see any of those conversations come to a halt because um, I don't, we don't know at the end of the day what will be in the proposed rule, but we do know what is in the actual law, and that's what people should be working off of right now. Thanks, Barbara. Um, another question that came in is uh, just to the extent that you are aware, have other advocacy groups such as school board associations, superintendent association, federal programs groups, et cetera, also shared concerns about the transportation proposal? Um, we have worked uh, closely with uh, the superintendents association. They have been very strong partners of ours in this and other matters. They are very aware, they are very concerned. Um, I, I think that some of the other school groups as well, obviously this is a, it's a one, you know, it's a small piece of a very large proposed rule and so people are still digesting it, but there has been some um, coverage in Education Week, for example, about this. So for sure the superintendents, I'm fairly sure that the um, the, some of the, the other school groups uh, are, are looking at this as well and of course we will reach out to them and be working with them and sharing our concerns too. Thanks Barbara and that's a really important point that this is one tiny piece of a, a very large set of regulations that have a lot of big ticket and important items and um, you know that's why I think it's so important for people who are working directly with students experiencing homelessness and students in foster care to really make their voices heard on this issue. Um, and not let it kind of get get lost in in the shuffle of everything else that's going on. And remember um, that there there are state school boards, there are state uh, superintendents associations, there are state organizations. So would really encourage you to work at the local and state level with those groups as well. Um, Here's just kind of a legal question that I think maybe there may be a bit of a confusion. So just to make sure that we're very clear on this, there's the question that says, does the law speak to what should occur if neither agency agrees to pay for the additional costs? Um, and, and the question specifically asks about the law, not the regulation. Um, so Barbara, I don't know if you want to go back to slide 12 so people can take a look at that again. Um, it really, you know, I would say, you know, reading it as an attorney, um, you know, it's an education statute and there is, an assur there is a, a language in there that says the, the procedures must ensure that transportation is provided, so the procedures have to ensure it. It doesn't necessarily say that the school district has to ensure it. Um, and by laying out the three conditions under which school districts will pay, it seems to me that the logical implication of that is that if those conditions are not met, that then it would be um, the child welfare agency who would pay but I'm not sure that's entirely clear. It is also important to note that if there are no additional costs incurred for the school of origin transportation, and so it's really just going to cost the same um, as local school transportation would cost, then of course the school district does need to pay for that. I think the law is very clear there. But yeah, and I would just add too that you know we, we, we didn't really talk about child welfare's existing obligations under fostering connections, but there are obligations to work with child welfare, to work with school districts to ensure educational stability. So this ESSA amendments were designed to create reciprocal uh, requirements so that federal education law and federal child welfare law matched. Uh, we are concerned that the proposed regulation does not create a reciprocal. It actually essentially takes away the child welfare responsibility and places it entirely on the school district. 
Um, one kind of follow-up question to that, too, that I think is very important. Someone asks, what is considered an additional cost? And that's a really important question. It's not something that's defined in the law. And uh, we've certainly heard from, from our contacts in school districts that that can be very tricky to even calculate what a cost or an additional cost would be. We do have a guide on our website for um, child welfare agencies and school districts as they sit down and start talking about these transportation plans. We don't have an answer to that question on our, in our guide, uh, mostly because it can be very, very different district to district and state to state. But there are some considerations and some questions for you to sort of think through. Um, so you might want to take a look at that. And that is on our ESA implementation webpage. Um, which I will go ahead and type into the chat box in a minute. But while I do that, Barbara, can you address a question that came in? Do we know a timeline on when these rules will actually be finalized and promulgated and we'll know for sure what, what they are going to be? We do not. However, um, again, like the comments are due August 1st. There is a rather large event happening in November with respect to the presidential election. And so there is a great sense of urgency for all of the federal agencies to finish up any regulatory process so that this administration um, basically completes it and it won't go over into the next administration. So I don't have a sense of, we don't, we, I can't give, you know, we can't give a final answer, but I am um, certain that the department will work feverishly to have these rules completed by the end of the year. Thanks, Barbara. And another question is just kind of about the interaction between regulations and laws. Um, once a regulation is made final and finally promulgated, uh, so that's, you know, after the public comments come in and after the agency makes its final decisions, that is considered to have the force of law. However, if a regulation uh, conflicts, conflicts with a law, um, there have been many circumstances where different advocacy agencies or public agencies have brought uh, lawsuits against different agencies saying that that agency's interpretation actually conflicts with the statute that Congress passed. So um, the, they really are on equal footing, um, but it, with that one caveat that there can't be a conflict. Um, I'm looking through the questions quickly. There's um, a question about, is there any specialized funding that would go to LEAs to pay for the transportation for students in foster care? There is no funding associated with this requirement. It's part of Title I, so there's the, um, I guess, the implication that Title I funds could be used for it, but there is no dedicated funding that was authorized to meet this obligation. Thanks, Barbara. And as I just um, look quickly, there's a rather complicated uh, question about allowable uses of title, uh, child welfare funds that I think is probably beyond our uh, scope or expertise at this moment. Um, but we also have a question, and I'll just read it to you. Uh, it says, many of our foster youth are in local youth shelters. Since they are in shelters, uh, homelessness provides the option of school of origin through the McKinney-Vento Act because of being placed in a shelter. However, it's the child welfare agency that many times prevents the school of origin transportation and, and the maintenance of the placement in the school of origin. What is being done to support having child welfare agencies be more uh, supportive and in favor of children remaining in their schools of origin? Well, one thing that we didn't talk about because we're really focused on the proposed rules here is another part of the Title I amendments for foster care, which are very important, which is in the state plan and is an assurance that the state education agency and the state child welfare agency will collaborate um, on educational stability, including staying in the school of origin when it's in a child's best interest, being immediately enrolled. So it's very McKinney-Vento-esque provisions for all students in foster care um, that will be part of the state uh, responsibility. Um, there will also, and, and so as part of that, um, we know that the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services do plan to issue joint guidance very soon 
to child welfare agencies and to, to um, education agencies about those bigger pieces around school of origin and immediate enrollment. In fact, Secretary King went on record at a hearing not too long ago saying that the guidance on foster care would be the first guidance that the department would issue on ESSA. So I think very soon we will see that guidance document um, produced and it should be, it will hopefully um, be engaging the child welfare agencies um, equally to this, the education agencies because uh, it really needs to be a collaborative effort if it's going to be successful. Thanks, Barbara. I think unless I miss some, I think I've gotten all the questions that were in the chat box. Um, there has been lots, lots and lots of comments submitted, which is wonderful, um, but because of that, I may have accidentally skipped over a question, so if I did, please feel free to just send that to us by email uh, separately, but hopefully I got to most of you. Um, and again, thank you so much for all the comments that you've submitted as well. Thanks, everybody. And again, please also, we hope if nothing else, we've encouraged you to uh, not just talk to us, but also find somebody, if not yourself, who can submit comments on behalf of your community. So thanks and have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Bye.